Okay, so it's a couple minutes after three, so I think we should get started at Richard's command. So, um, so I welcome you all to pulmonary critical care grand rounds today. Um, thank you for those of you who are here and welcome to those of you who are online. I think as far as the online people, just hold your questions. We won't respond to raised hands during the lecture, but, um, but uh, Dr. Rochester will be happy to take um, questions at the end. So, um, so it gives me great pleasure today to welcome my friend and colleague, Carolyn Rochester, otherwise known as Carly Rochester, to those of us who have had really the true privilege of working with you all these years. So, um, you know, I was printing this resume this morning and I thought, oh my God, this is like an environmental faux pas because this is one weighty document, you guys. <laughs> And there's no way that I can really do justice to what's in here, but I'll give it, I'll give it a little try. Since I've killed the trees already, you know, <laughs> we might as well, uh, we might as well go through it. So um, Dr. Rochester came to Yale quite a number of years ago. I won't say how many from so Columbia, I know, I know. <laughs> from Columbia PNS, where she was elected to AOA. She did her internal medicine residency at Columbia Presbyterian as well, and part of her pulmonary fellowship, research part of it in airways disease, and um, then came to Yale to complete her pulmonary fellowship. She has risen through the ranks to professor, which she attained in 2017, and has taken um, many administrative leadership roles, both at Yale New Haven and also at VA Connecticut. So most relevant, um, recently she has been the director of the COPD program at Yale. The program's ever enlarging, as I think you know. So it's been a, a big um, boon to us here at Yale to have her as director of that program. Remarkably, she's been the medical director of pulmonary rehab at the VA since 2002, which is incredible. So 20 years of leadership at the VA in pulmonary rehab, which is terrific. So her resume goes through many of her um, achievements over the years. She has been a recipient of many uh, grants, most recently a VA Merit Award which she, um, in, with which she studied electrical muscle stimulation and the rehabilitation of patients with COPD. She's also had NIH awards, she's had American Lung Association awards, and has worked with numerous industry-sponsored studies as well. This weighty document has over 100 publications in it, which really speaks to Dr. Rochester's incredible talent at collaborating with people, at mentoring trainees, and really creating an environment of um, scientific practice in pulmonary rehab. She's had numerous speaking engagements, which I will not go through. And I think what really stands out in this resume is her service to the American Thoracic Society which um, has been great over the years, serving on a number of task forces, most recently chairing the Assembly of Pulmonary Rehab through 2017 and serving on the board of directors for the ATS. And she will speak to you today about her um, recent work as a co-chair on the committee to develop the clinical practice guidelines for pulmonary rehab, which were published in the summer of 2023. So all of this weighty resume is sort of culminated by recognition of her achievements by a number of awards that I think are worth mentioning. I'll only mention three, but there are more awards. Most recently, she has been, well, she will be, I suppose, it hasn't been awarded yet, the 2024 recipient of the American Thoracic Society Assembly and Pulmonary Rehab Lifetime Achievement Award which I think is probably a little bit premature because knowing Dr. Rochester, there's a lot more in her bucket that's gonna happen before, uh, before we finish up here. So um, 2023 recipient of also a prestigious award, the Tom, Thomas L. Petty Distinguished Pulmonary Scholar Award awarded by the American Association of Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Rehab. And finally, the only other award I will mention is um, one that I know is very important to Dr. Rochester, and that's the Richard A. Mathe Outstanding Education Award that was awarded by our section for all of her contributions to medical education. And really, medical education has been a huge part of Dr. Rochester's career. So, Carly, with no further ado, I welcome you educate us now. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, Hillary, thank you so very much for that um, most kind, uh, um, you know, seems over, over, over laudatory, um, but thank you very much for that kind uh, uh, in, in sort of uh, introduction. And um, today we're gonna talk about uh, pulmonary rehabilitation, and I'll focus mainly on the ATS clinical practice guideline and sprinkle in some other uh, uh, relevant updates from the last year. Um, just want to uh, highlight here that uh, the process and procedures for getting your CME credit, uh, and there's also a text code on the, on the board there. Um, and these are my disclosures. Um, I don't have any relevant disclosures particularly related to today's topic. So uh, in my talk today, uh, I'm gonna to begin with a little bit of an introduction. Can you all hear me all right? This is the, my phone. Um, and uh, the reason for this is while I did give a talk on pulmonary rehabilitation to our fellows within, I think the year before last, um, not all the fellows who are with us now were present for that. And I also think in the context of what we're gonna talk about today, it's helpful if we all come up to the same starting point and sort of be on the same page in regards to some basics about pulmonary rehabilitation. I'm then gonna highlight some of the uh, important existing barriers to pulmonary rehabilitation. Um, we'll focus the majority of the talk on the new ATS clinical practice guidelines on pulmonary rehabilitation. And as I said, sprinkle in a couple of other relevant uh, recent uh, highlights from the literature. So let me start by uh, just calling to your attention. I know you're all well aware of this, but chronic respiratory disease poses a major burden both to patients and health systems worldwide. As of 2017, 545 million people worldwide had a chronic respiratory disease. Chronic respiratory disease was the third leading cause of death and accounted for a high level of disability adjusted life years. And there was a worldwide prevalence of COPD of approximately 4.1%. In the United States, uh, there is also an estimated prevalence of COPD of approximately 4.2%. Um, and there were two, 12, 212 million prevalent cases of COPD reported globally as of 2019, again, accounting for a high number of deaths and lots of disability adjusted life years. So people really struggle with uh, their chronic respiratory diseases as do health systems and the associated costs. So now it's important to recognize just from the outset that exercise impairment and functional disability in chronic respiratory disease has a multifactorial basis. So in addition to the structural and functional changes in the lung and or the chest wall with their associated ventilatory impairment and or gas exchange disturbances that clearly do have an important role in leading to dyspnea and exercise intolerance, People have many other factors that contribute to exercise impairment and disability, notable amongst which are several comorbidities, such as cardiovascular limitations, orthopedic limitations, anemia, and importantly also in the chronic respiratory disease population, skeletal muscle dysfunction, which we'll come back to in just a minute. So this combination of things going on in the respiratory system itself, as well as systemic manifestations of the disease, all collectively lead to exercise intolerance. And these in turn lead to a reduced quality of life, increased association with anxiety, depression, fear, social, social isolation, anxiety itself further breeds dyspnea. Dyspnea also contributes to exercise intolerance, all of this together leads to lower than, than normal physical activity levels, decreased participation in activities of daily living, which in turn leads to people doing less because they feel more short of breath. They worry about being short of breath, so they become more deconditioned. And as that happens, the functional disability gets worse. And we get into this vicious circle where all of that then further contributes to progression of the underlying muscle dysfunction, cardiovascular deconditioning, and so on. So this is a common cycle for a majority of people with chronic respiratory disease. And on top of that, many of our disease states are peppered by intermittent exacerbations with fur which further worsen symptoms, functional disability, worsen quality of life, increased hospitalization risk, and also are associated with increased mortality. And if we look at people with chronic respiratory disease as a whole, a majority or many, if not a majority, 
have ongoing persistent symptoms and limitations despite optimized pharmacotherapy. So that being the case, additional strategies to manage them are needed. And this is where pulmonary rehabilitation comes in. So what is pulmonary rehabilitation? It's a comprehensive intervention based on a thorough patient assessment followed by patient-tailored therapies, which include but are not limited to exercise training, education, and behavior change designed to improve the physical and psychological condition of people with chronic respiratory disease and to promote the long-term adherence to health-enhancing behaviors. Put another way, what we're trying to do is reduce or at least minimize patient symptom burden, maximize their exercise performance, promote their autonomy, improve their participation in daily activities with greater ease, enhance their health-related quality of life, and affect long-term adherence to health-enhancing behaviors such as recognition and management of disease exacerbations and undertaking physical activity. The core components of pulmonary rehabilitation are as follows. First, supervised and progressive individually tailored exercise training, usually a combination of aerobic and strength training of the upper and lower extremities. Second, self-management education. And this relates to uh, information about underlying disease, management of the disease, coping with the disease, learning how to live with the disease, addressing many aspects of living with chronic respiratory disease beyond those which can be handled in a 15 to 20 or 30 minute outpatient uh, clinic visit, where we generally barely have time to renew medications and get tests ordered, much less deal with these uh, longer term issues. The third key component of pulmonary rehabilitation is patient assessment and outcomes measures. And we need at least the core ones of exercise assessment, dyspnea assessment, quality of life, and there are others that are recommended, such as nutritional occupational assessments. One can do many other things too, like anxiety, depression, hospitalizations, and a variety of other outcomes, uh, fatigue, for example. But the core ones, we at least have to measure exercise, capacity, dyspnea, quality of life. Okay, And these uh, components are delivered by a trained healthcare provider staff, usually a multidisciplinary team, but the, com the content components vary widely across programs and across health systems based on resources available. You need at least one person who's able and uh, skilled and experienced with provision of uh, supervised uh, structured exercise training. The key expected outcomes in a nutshell, and we're gonna come back to this in a moment, are improved exercise capacity and tolerance, reduced dyspnea and fatigue, improved health-related quality of life, improved emotional function, and for those with COPD also, you can expect a reduction in healthcare utilization and a reduction in mortality. And again, we'll come back to those issues in just a minute. Now, I want to come back just to bring us again all to the same page uh, a little bit about the rationale for pulmonary rehabilitation, other than that people remain symptomatic despite their pharmacotherapies. So clearly in pulmonary rehabilitation, when we work with people over a several week period, usually in the United States, programs meet two to three times a week for eight to 12 weeks would be a typical outpatient center-based program in the United States. Um, that varies widely sort of worldwide. But patients clearly do learn about their disease. And so with that, they're able to manage their disease better, recognize and prevent exacerbations better, partner with their healthcare professionals better, and gain less anxiety and, and, and distress related to their disease so they cope with their disease better. But in addition to that, the scientific underpinnings of pulmonary rehabilitation largely rest on the role of the exercise training. And this is where we have to come back to the presence of skeletal muscle dysfunction. And I'm using COPD as an example here, but muscle dysfunction exists in other uh, chronic respiratory diseases as well. So when people have deconditioning, they feel short of breath, so they do less. They become couch potatoes. They don't undertake as much activity as they once did. This and other factors, including systemic inflammation, hypoxemia, aging, and a variety of other factors, collectively, is associated with proven structural and functional changes in skeletal muscle fibers, for example, in the legs, where you have to use, which you have to use to walk and do daily activities. It's been shown, for example, that in the limb muscle of people with COPD, there's a decrease in the amount of oxidative enzymes, a fiber type shift with a decreased number of endurance exercise fibers, fewer capillary contacts per muscle fiber, 
with altered resting and exercise energy metabolism and mitochondrial dysfunction. Collectively, these things lead to decreased muscle mass as well as reduced muscle strength and endurance, which clearly decreases exercise ability. But also, these physiologic changes lead to earlier onset of anaerobic metabolism, lactic acid production. Put another way, people get anaerobic metabolism onset at a lower level of activity than is normal. And when that happens, there's an increased minute ventilation demand. With increased minute ventilation demand in our people with COPD, we get increased lung hyperinflation with impairment of respiratory muscle mechanics, and all of this collectively adds to the decreased exercise ability. So importantly, pulmonary rehabilitation, as I said before, does not act directly on the lungs. We are not expecting changes in lung function. What we are doing with exercise training is stabilizing and or reversing these underlying physiologic abnormalities. And what that does in turn, as I'll show you in a moment, is lead to improved exercise tolerance. Pulmonary rehab and exercise training, and in particular high intensity uh, exercise training, leads, leads to an increase in oxidative enzyme capacity, a reversal of the fiber type shift, increased capillary contacts, and better uh, energy metabolism and energy utilization. And collectively, what this means is if we train the limb muscles, we actually help the breathing despite no change in FEV1. So our exercise training, as would be expected with any of us here if we undertake exercise training, leads to improved aerobic fitness, enables us to reach a higher maximal oxygen consumption and higher maximal workload, and importantly also, as I said, a higher workload before we get to lactic acidosis or a delayed anaerobic threshold with reduced lactate levels. And in turn, we have reduced dyspnea and improved exercise tolerance and reduced dynamic hyperinflation if the underlying dose diagnosis is COPD. So this is really important. It's physiologic gain despite no change in lung function. This works, and it works in large part because of these um, physiologic underpinnings. So who's a candidate? Well, people with chronic respiratory diseases who remain symptomatic, for example, with dyspnea, fatigue, anxiety, depression, functional limitations, people with physical and or functional limitations, that may be exercise or activity intolerance. It may be di difficulty doing activities of daily living. Um, it may just be low physical activity levels and who have suboptimal disease management, such as recognition and management of exacerbations, or who have poor coping or just have impaired self-efficacy to manage their disease, and people who have impaired quality of life and or, I would add, are having frequent hospitalizations. Any of these things, despite optimized medical management, with very few absolute contraindications, such as unstable angina or unstable arrhythmia or long bone fracture or you know, being bed bound, wheelchair bound, and so on. All of these things would qualify for um, pulmonary re rehabilitation. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is, despite being one of the most effective therapies for chronic respiratory diseases, pulmonary rehabilitation is grossly underutilized and under-resourced relative to the demand that exists for it. In the United States and elsewhere, fewer than 5% of people with COPD who could benefit for it, those with stable disease and or those post-exacerbation actually receive pulmonary rehabilitation. And this is actually, we don't have data for people with non-COPD disorders, but the numbers are likely even significantly lower than that. And this has been studied across a variety of different health systems. So this is pretty poor considering how effective pulmonary rehab is. Now there's a wide variety of patient and health system and societal factors that contribute to underutilization and poor access to pulmonary rehabilitation. First is we have a limited number and capacity of programs. An international survey done in the last um, several years showed that the vast majority of pulmonary rehabilitation programs worldwide can accommodate fewer than 100 patients per year. And if you think about the numbers of people with chronic respiratory disease that I showed you in a moment ago, there's a big imbalance there between the number in need and the number who um, are actually able to get into these programs. Secondly, as we'll come back to a little bit more in a minute, there's heterogeneous geographic access. Patients face significant physical challenges of travel, Patients and the general public has low awareness of the process and benefits of pulmonary rehab. We actually have a limited number of slightly alarmingly limited number of trained healthcare providers in the provision of pulmonary rehabilitation. We also uh, have suboptimal healthcare professionals referrals to pulmonary rehab. 
And also very alarmingly, there exist racial and socioeconomic disparities regarding uh, referrals and access to pulmonary rehab. And there's grossly insufficient funding and reimbursement. Pulmonary rehab, for example, is reimbursed at less than half the rate of cardiac rehabilitation, despite being a sort of fairly uh, comparable uh, concept and, uh, and, and type of intervention. So we have all of these things that we have to uh, deal with. Now, um, back in 2015, we published a um, ATS policy statement on expanding implementation, use, and delivery of pulmonary rehabilitation worldwide, in which we articulated several areas that needed to be addressed. And for each of those areas, we posited recommendations and proposed actionable items that could help to move these uh, issues forward and, and deal with some of these barriers. And inroads have been made since then. For example, in particular, um, advanced research around novel models of pulmonary rehab, such as tele-rehab to increase access, which we'll talk about more in a moment. Um, and also things like um, learning more about the role of pulmonary rehab for non-COPD respiratory diseases. Those fields have moved forward and, and studies have been done, as I'll show you in a minute, um, to highlight the problems with geographic access. Um, but clearly, more work is needed in this area. Let me just illustrate for you a couple of studies that show the um, heterogeneity or a sort of dire situation with regards to heterogeneous access. This was a study by Moskovitz, um, published in CHEST in 2019. They did a rigorous analysis of um, learning where um, pulmonary rehabilitation programs that were outpatient pulmonary rehab programs affiliated with um, hospital-based settings existed in the United States. And what they found was heterogeneity based on the region of the country as shown here. Um, but what I want to highlight for you is down here that they found a total of 2,068 hospital outpatient pulmonary rehab programs based at 4,409 hospitals. 1,366 counties had at least one program, but there were 1,776 counties in the United States that had no program. And by the way, 697 of those had no hospital even, much less a pulmonary rehabilitation program. And so if you look here at the color coding, um, the percentage of hospitals that have a pulmonary rehab program shown in red, those are areas where fewer than 25% hospitals have a program. And these big, vast areas in blue, uh, fewer than 50% of hospitals have a pulmonary rehab program associated with it. So this is a real problem, um, this geographic access. And again, this is um, further more recent updated data, again, sort of driven in part by the need to really characterize the nature and the extent of the problem so as to begin to tackle it. Um, there's two other recent studies that have shown there's significant heterogeneity in travel distance and time to pulmonary rehabilitation. We know that if people have to travel more than 30 minutes um, or so, then it's, uh, they're less than 50% as likely to attend pulmonary rehabilitation. And this study by Mala and colleagues from last year, they used geodesic coding um, relative to where people were living to figure out uh, driving times or distances uh, to the nearest pulmonary rehabilitation program. And you could see that there was a spectrum of ranges people had to drive, but note overall 61.5% of people in the country as a whole had uh, pulmonary rehab available within 10 miles, but only 11% or so of those in rural areas had pulmonary rehab within 10 miles. And they found a total of nearly 1,700 pulmonary rehab centers across the US and that came out to one for every 6,030 6, individuals with COPD. That's pretty poor, right? And the mean distance to the nearest center was 12.4 miles. Again, those living in rural areas, 95% less likely to have pulmonary rehab within 10 miles of their residence compared to those in metropolitan areas. So overall, very poor access to pulmonary rehab. And our own Peter Kahn from our fellowship program um, recently published this uh, uh, further update looking at the shortest travel time, not just travel distance, um, to uh, pulmonary rehab programs in the United States. Um, and they found that about 48% of the total population in the US was living within 15 minutes of a pulmonary rehab program. But again, they found disparities, especially out in the West, where only 26% of the Native American population within 15 minutes of a drive of pulmonary rehab. 
Okay, and this doesn't even address the rural, uh, the, the urban disparities across racial divides and things that also exist even within urban areas where pulmonary rehab programs are present. So um, we have big work to do on this. So collectively with all these issues, back in 2018, a group of us got together. We had the idea to try to um, pull together a task force. And we made a proposal to the ATS to work on an updated uh, clinical practice guideline for pulmonary rehabilitation. Um, and I, I should note that this, um, the, the project was accepted back in 2019. We got funded, we launched, and then guess what happened? COVID started right as we were starting our project. And so everything we did that for this entire guideline was done um, iteratively via Zoom or conference calls, and we didn't have any in-person meetings whatsoever. Um, so it's amazing that this actually came to fruition. But what we did was we assembled a multidisciplinary task force. There were four of us who were co-chairs, and we had four methodologists. We had eight or so, uh, or several pulmonologists, eight physiotherapists, a respiratory therapist, two nurses, a hospitalist, a cardiologist, um, and uh, an exercise physiologist, and a patient representative um, who was a really wonderful, helpful addition. We also were very careful to bring in early career people, and we had people representing uh, different, different countries. So now the a question might come up, why do we need an updated clinical practice guideline on pulmonary rehabilitation? Well, first of all, in the United States, the last published clinical practice guideline on pulmonary rehabilitation was in 2007. There was a disease management document for COPD published in 2011 in the Annals of Internal Medicine that did say they recommend pulmonary rehab, but only for people with COPD with FEV1s less than 50% predicted, which is now a really debunked limitation. Right, And there are existing uh, guidelines from other countries. The British Thoracic Society, they just updated theirs, but they published one in 2010. There was one from, uh, sorry, Canada's was 2010, British Thoracic Society 2013, and Australia, New Zealand in 2017. But that was the last even international published guideline on pulmonary rehabilitation. So we thought we needed another one. It was time for another one because the evidence base has expanded dramatically in recent years, both in terms of stable COPD in the post-exacerbation state, as well as other chronic respiratory diseases and novel models for pulmonary rehab delivery. Second, as I showed you a moment ago, pulmonary rehab remains overtly underutilized despite existing guidelines, okay? And we want to highlight awareness of pulmonary rehabilitation. We want healthcare professionals to know more about it, to be more comfortable discussing it with their patients, and to enable a greater number of referrals. We also wanted to raise awareness among patients and the general public. Um, and it's important to note here that as we do advocacy work for pulmonary rehab nationally and internationally, United States healthcare policymakers and payers do not acknowledge or consider non-US-based clinical practice guidelines. So it doesn't matter how good those other international guidelines are, they are not recognized when it comes to providing funding or support or infrastructure for US-based pulmonary rehab. So we felt an updated clinical practice guideline was needed both to improve the clinical practice of pulmonary rehab, as well as to guide and advance healthcare policy and funding and reimbursement for pulmonary rehab. So let me just briefly highlight for you the methodology involved in developing an ATS clinical practice guideline because it's a very strict policy with a rigorous standardized set of procedures. This is not a comprehensive review document of the evidence in pulmonary rehab across the board, not at all. It is a strictly formatted process that you must adhere to exactly and it has precise methodology involved as follows. The first thing is you get your panel formed, which we, I just mentioned to you. The second is you develop so-called PICO questions or PICO questions, I don't know how you pronounce that, but P being the patient population, I the interve intervention, C the comparator, and O which outcomes you're going to assess. And you can choose up to six questions. Beyond that, it's too much for one document. So we chose questions that we thought 
were most likely to highlight key aspects and key outcomes of pulmonary rehab with the greatest potential to impact clinical practice, public policy, and reimbursement for pulmonary rehab, because those are areas in, of such great need. Now, the outcomes to be analyzed for each of those selected PICO questions is pre-selected, predetermined by the guideline panel using a modified Delphi approach. And there were two rounds of Delphi survey. survey. And basically the panel reaches consensus on one, for each question, one critical outcome and up to five other quote, important outcomes. That's to say there's lots of outcomes that can't be necessarily looked at within one single document, but that's how the process works. Where possible, we use data from existing high quality systematic reviews and where um, there was need to update the systematic reviews, we did extensive literature reviews and updated the, the searches accordingly. We used the AMSTAR 2 checklist to praise the quality of published systematic reviews, and then the grading of recommendations, assessment development, so-called grade evaluation approach to appraise the quality of evidence and to formulate and grade our recommendations. And after all this analysis was done and multiple rounds of discussion around every aspect of it, there was a vote on each recommendation for each of the PICO questions at the end that ultimately went into the document. Any questions on that method? Okay. So now we're gonna do a little walking tour through the uh, clinical practice guideline. As, as I said, I'll add a few little additional uh, uh, recent updated papers per, per type of question um, in, in just a minute. So our first PICO question was, should adults with stable COPD undertake pulmonary rehabilitation. So for this question, our population was adults with COPD who are medically stable, that is to say, no exacerbation in the recent four weeks. The intervention was pulmonary rehabilitation. And the studies that were included were outpatient or inpatient, but they were all center-based uh, uh, pulmonary rehabilitation programs. The comparator was no pulmonary rehabilitation or usual medical care. And the critical pre-specified outcome we chose for this PICO was exercise capacity, the other important outcomes, health-related quality of life, dyspnea, adverse events, and healthcare utilization. For this question, we found uh, data, we analyzed data from 82 randomized controlled trials that had 4,674 participants. The mean FEV1 of the stable COPD patients in these trials ranged 26 to 75%, so a range of severity um, from mild to very severe. So as you can see on this uh, table here, for the critical outcome of exercise capacity as measured by the six minute walk distance, pulmonary rehabilitation led to a significant improvement in walk distance with a mean difference of 44 meters, which was greater than the minimal clinically important difference for that measure. As far as our important outcomes, we also saw significant improvements in dyspnea as measured by the chronic respiratory disease dyspnea questionnaire, improvements in health-related quality, health quality of life based on the St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire, and no significant adverse events in the 42 randomized controlled trials where it was reported. And again, all of these things met or, or exceeded the minimal clinically important difference for the uh, relevant outcome. We also saw a rate ratio of hospitalizations of 0 0.76. And we're gonna come back to hospitalizations in a moment when we talk about the post-exacerbation population. So our first recommendation from the guideline was that for adults with stable COPD, we recommend participation in pulmonary rehabilitation. And this was a strong recommendation with moderate quality evidence. Our panel placed high value on improvements in exercise capacity, dyspnea, and health-related quality of life. We recognize and certainly published literature notes that patients value the benefits of pulmonary rehab and we don't see significant adverse events. We recognize that there are patient barriers, as I mentioned before, including burden to patients of travel cost and inconvenience, disruption of daily routines and the like, but the benefits of pulmonary rehabilitation, um, we felt outweigh those uh, downsides such that um, patients should be uh, recommended or referred for pulmonary rehabilitation. Just to mention a couple of very quick sort of additional new updates in the field for stable COPD. Um, one of the things that plagues uh, pulmonary rehabilitation, especially in terms of insurance payment, is that we lack good uh, standardized outcomes used across multiple programs for the purposes of benchmarking. And this also limits our ability to 
measure novel models outcomes as compared to conventional center-based pulmonary rehab programs outcomes. So in the last year, a core outcome set was developed using a modified Delphi survey um, by Alda Marquesas group and a group of people um, in Europe. And this was done in seven languages in 29 countries. So this uh, document likely will be useful in the future to inform um, benchmarking in pulmonary rehab. One other sort of important health disparities related issue is that not all countries and especially low and middle income countries have adequate equipment to undertake conventional center-based multimodality exercise training using equipment. Um, and those areas tend to use minimal equipment such as walking, resistance bands, or even handheld weights or soup cans or water bottles, various uh, non-fancy exercise things. And there was a systematic review this past year of 19 randomized controlled trials um, looking at uh, supervised exercise um, sort of according to a standard process for pulmonary rehab or a typical process for pulmonary rehab, but using minimal equipment. And again, they showed comparable benefits to equipment-based training in several outcomes. We're always looking as to how to optimize exercise training. Um, and one recent study that I thought was interesting in stable COPD showed that use of an automatic O2 titration system to keep the person sat at around 92% or better um, as compared to picking a selected flow rate and then having to react to it if they desat showed an improved walking endurance time as compared to constant O2 flow. Um, and another interesting but somewhat disappointing study actually um, tried to give very specific functionally focused exercise training to specific types of tasks to see if that led to better performance of activities of daily living compared to conventional generalized aerobic and resistance training. And unfortunately, they didn't see a significant benefit there. One of the big issues that was not in the guideline, um, but is a very important issue also is what happens to people's physical activity levels after participating in pulmonary rehab? And we know that physical activity levels are low amongst people with COPD and other chronic respiratory diseases for sure. The impact of pulmonary rehab on physical activity outcomes has been much less clear because findings have been heterogeneous across trials. But this was a recent meta-analysis of 46 studies in more than 4,000 participants that showed the addition of a phys physical activity promotion uh, intervention to conventional center-based pulmonary rehab actually was able to lead to greater steps per day. Not an, incre not an increase in the intensity of physical activity, but at least greater steps. So that's a step in the right direction, if you'll forgive me for that um, um, horrible, uh, horrible pun. Okay, back to the guideline. Should adults with COPD, our second question was, should adults with COPD undertake pulmonary rehab following hospitalization for an exacerbation? And here, our population was adults with COPD who've been hospitalized for COPD exacerbation. Our intervention was pulmonary rehab convinced within three weeks of hospital discharge. The comparison, no pulmonary rehab outcomes. Our critical one was healthcare utilization and important ones, exercise capacity, health-related quality of life, dyspnea, mortality, and adverse events. And so for this, we saw, again, in 17 randomized controlled trials, 1,724 participants, a range of FEV 1% predicted severity. For our critical outcome of hospital readmission, the odds ratio of getting readmitted if you undertook pulmonary rehab after your discharge was 0 0.48, very significant. And for our important outcomes, we again saw significant improvements in six minute walk distance, St. George's respiratory questionnaire-based quality of life, um, there was not a sig clinically significant or minimal clinical important difference, significant MRC dyspnea score change, um, and the odds ratio for mortality was 0 0.75. Although I'll mention the trials that we analyzed here were not powered to detect a change in mortality. Importantly, also no adverse events. So our recommendation here was for adults with COPD, we recommend participation in pulmonary rehabilitation following hospitalization for an exacerbation with a strong recommendation and moderate quality evidence. We placed a high value on reducing hospital readmissions and improving exercise capacity and health-related quality of life. Patients certainly value staying out of the hospital. We didn't see significant adverse events and we placed a lower value on the burden of attendance. 
I will say just a couple of additional notes from the last year. Um, I and uh, Alex Jensen, Jenkins led this uh, effort, um, but I and others from our guideline panel, we updated this systematic review and meta-analysis meta um, uh, looking at um, pulmonary rehab after hospitalization for COPD exacerbation. And again, very similar findings to what I just showed you from, from the original guideline. Um, we did use this to inform the guideline, but we published it uh, separately. And um, there were only a couple of areas where we didn't see uh, significant improvements. We didn't, for example, see a significant benefit on the um, COPD assessment test. And there was one other questionnaire we didn't see a benefit on. And again, we didn't see a significant effect on, or a statistically significant effect on, on mortality. But I do want to highlight this very important study. Many of you have probably seen this already, but it's a very important study in my opinion. Um, this is a real world study published in 2020 by Peter Lindenauer uh, in JAMA. And it was a retrospective analysis of nearly 200,000 fee-for-service Medicare beneficiaries who'd been hospitalized for COPD in the United States. Um, and it showed that initiation of pulmonary rehab within 90 days was associated with a lower risk of death over one year with an absolute risk reduction of nearly 7%. Here you see the graph of people who, uh, of mortality who, who did, did not versus did have pulmonary rehabilitation. And 7.3% of patients who initiated within 90 days died compared with nearly 20% who initiated later or not at all. So this is really important real world data that I think we have to pay very close attention to. And notably also there was a dose effect where every three additional sessions of pulmonary rehab was associated with a lower risk of death. Okay, so this is um, different by the way. Note that our original data we anal analyzed in the guideline was um, trials that looked at delivery within three weeks of the hospital discharge. This is within 90 days, which is probably a much more realistic time frame. We all know it's hard to get patients even to come to clinic within three weeks of hospital discharge, much less go to pulmonary rehab. So identifying the optimal timing post exacerbation is an issue. One other really important study from the last couple of years that I want to highlight here that should be a very important one for payers to, to, to clue into is that Chris Mosher from Duke and colleagues looked at the cost effectiveness of pulmonary rehab participation after hospitalization for COPD amongst US adults with COPD. And they found an estimated net cost savings of nearly $6,000 per patient over the course of a lifetime with potential savings, if you look at all the patients with COPD who get hospitalized, potential savings to Medicare of one to $1.25 billion annually if appropriate people get pulmonary rehab that really should raise people's awareness. And we all have to do a better job of detailing costs to our payers, but this is important finding. Okay, question three, should adults with interstitial lung disease undertake pulmonary rehabilitation? Well, for here, our population is adults who are medically stable with ILD. The intervention was pulmonary rehab at a variety of different sites versus no pulmonary rehab. And our pre-specified outcome critically was exercise capacity and these are the other important outcomes shown here. In 21 randomized controlled trials with 909 participants with the mean FVC ranging from 55 to 86% of predicted, we saw again in this population significant gains in exercise capacity measured by six minute walk distance, significant improvements in quality of life, dyspnea scores, no significant difference in hospitalization but an odds ratio for mortality of 0 0.4, uh, 0 0.4 and no adverse events in the 10 randomized controlled trials where it was reported. So for recommendation number three, for adults with interstitial lung disease, we recommend participation in pulmonary rehab with a strong recommendation and moderate quality evidence. We placed a high value on improving exercise capacity, dyspnea and quality of life. These outcomes are likely important to patients. There are no significant adverse events. And again, we placed a lower value on the burden of travel cost and inconvenience. There's a couple of honorable mention uh, studies. And again, you can read these uh, more at your leisure. We don't have time to go into them in detail, but a couple of sort of important issues within the field of interstitial lung disease rehab. One is the duration of benefit because studies so far have suggested that the, the benefits may wane over six months for ILD as compared to eight to 12 months per pulmonary rehab participation program. 
as compared to COPD. And so there was one study that was published in the last year that looked at the use of a home maintenance intervention after initial pulmonary rehab and showed significant better maintenance of endurance time. So that's something for us to um, investigate more. Another important and very intriguing thing is it turns out people with interstitial lung disease and also people with pulmonary hypertension, as we'll see in a moment, often have inspiratory muscle weakness. And um, there was a study that showed that eight weeks of inspiratory muscle training to pulmonary rehab in ILD, who also had inspiratory muscle weakness, improved exercise capacity, respiratory muscle strength, quality of life, and dyspnea. So unlike COPD, where adding inspiratory muscle training to generalized exercise training doesn't seem to add that much to the general uh, physical function, in other conditions, it might. And it's, it goes to show that we can't just assume that what's true about one disease may be true for all others. On the other hand, high intensity interval training in COPD is a very successful strategy in COPD, leads to excellent improvement in aerobic fitness. But in the ILD population, it was recently shown that the peak gains in exercise capacity and in other outcomes may be less as compared to more moderate intensity training, and there was a faster decline over time. So high intensity interval training for ILD may not be the way to go, more work needed. And likewise, there's still a tremendous paucity of data on anxiety and depression. There's a couple of studies suggest benefit in the ILD population, but this is something well proven in COPD. So again, areas for further work. Question four, should adults with pulmonary hypertension undertake pulmonary rehab? Well, our population was medically stable adults with pH of a variety of types. Intervention was pulmonary rehab. Comparison, no pulmonary rehab. The critical exercise, uh, outcome pre-specified was exercise capacity. Other important outcomes, health-related quality of life, dyspnea, functional class, mortality, and adverse events. Here we had 14 trials, randomized controlled trials to analyze with 571 participants, and the mean pulmonary artery pressure here was 36 to 59 millimeters of mercury. And pulmonary rehab in this population led, again, to a significant improvement in six-minute walk distance, also improvement in quality of life measured by the SF36, improvements in functional class but didn't meet dramatic significance, no significant uh, increase in adverse events, but know what this is in the middle here. In regards to dyspnea, none of these trials looked at dyspnea, which I find really surprising. We were really shocked when we saw this. It really, that there's no dyspnea data at all in the pulmonary hypertension. So this is a right project for our PH team if we wanna um, add something to the literature. But importantly, no deaths noted. So for adults with pulmonary hypertension, we do suggest participation in pulmonary rehabilitation. But here the evidence is a little bit less. We made a conditional recommendation and low quality evidence. Um, and we do think these outcomes are important to patients. We didn't see adverse events in supervised programs, but two important caveats here. One, the staff really should have expertise in giving exercise training to people with pulmonary hypertension. And two, patients must be optimized on medical therapy um, and, of course, uh, oxygen saturation. And in general, these people should avoid high-intensity exercise that may trigger circulatory collapse, especially if the pH is severe. Couple of honorable mentions. Again, there was a, a trial looking at the benefits of inspiratory muscle training, um, and there was a trial showing benefits of pulmonary uh, rehab for people um, uh, within six to 72 months who were persistently dyspneic after pulmonary emboli. So um, these are some other recent updates from the literature. The fifth question, should adults with chronic respiratory disease undertake telerehabilitation? Again, this is important because we need models to increase access to pulmonary rehab for especially rural areas or people who can't or are unable to leave their homes to go to a center-based program. Um, and we really also saw the need for this during the COVID uh, you know, pandemic when all pulmonary rehab programs came to a screeching halt. So here our population is adults with chronic respiratory disease. Um, compared to a variety of models of remotely delivered rehab or tele-rehab. And our comparator here was not no rehab. Our comparator here was center-based, traditional pulmonary rehab. Our critical pre-specified outcome was exercise capacity, important outcomes, health-related quality of life, dyspnea, completion of pulmonary rehab, adverse events, and healthcare utilization. And what we saw, again, was comparable benefits. Again, we're not looking for necessarily better benefits, but comparable benefits to center-based rehab were seen for six-minute walk distance, exercise capacity, health-related quality of life, dyspnea, 
um, and the odds ratio for hospitalization was 0 0.65, there actually was a higher odds of program completion for people who had uh, telerehabilitation, and there was no increased signal of adverse events. So, you know, this is really important because it adds to the field and it's, it highlights we need to be able to develop these models more beyond the research setting. Um, but they're not really a replacement for center-based program. We still don't know what the optimal model of telerehab is, and almost all the patients in all these trials that we looked at were COPD patients. So while we have evidence to date, as I showed you, of benefit, there's lots of different models that have been used. The data is very heterogeneous, but there's some important issues to consider. It certainly may increase access, but may not be suitable for all people, either medically or based on internet access or tech literacy or other factors. We don't have infrastructure. We don't have a trained healthcare professional force. We don't have funding and reimbursements for widespread implementation. There are some legal and privacy concerns. We don't have standardized methods for ensuring program quality. There are some pop-up online programs that market for profit to patients to go online and get pulmonary rehab, but they're largely untested. Their outcomes are largely unconvincingly proven. And so these programs are not meant to replace center-based pulmonary rehab, but rather to complement them. And we need a lot more data about other outcomes and outcomes of telerehab in non-COPD disorder. There's a couple of honorable mention uh, uh, updates in telerehabilitation. Um, again, patients who get telerehab feel that they have autonomy promotion, they feel engaged, they enjoy it, but we can't make assumptions about whether everyone likes it because a different study this year showed that if people were actually offered a choice of center-based pulmonary rehab or tele-rehab, the higher odds of completion were with the center-based pulmonary rehab. Uh, and um, those who op opted for this mobile health program were younger and still working, and that makes sense. Um, and another sort of disparity to think about is we think about this telerehab as increasing access, particularly in rural areas. But a recent study from Marilyn Moy and her group showed that when telerehab, a uh, physical activity self management intervention, was given to people with COPD, the steps per day increased in people in urban areas, but not in rural areas. So we can't make assumptions about just because we're providing access that it will be used or that will be as effective for those people um, in those rural areas. So more to be done. And I'm going to just uh, summarize this maintenance last PICO here because there's one other issue I want to get to before we close and, and say that um, out of despite 21 randomized controlled trials with nearly 1,800 participants for our last PICO um, with a range of severity of COPD, we really cannot at this time formally recommend maintenance pulmonary rehab, not because we don't believe in it, but because the evidence doesn't clearly as yet show a convincing set of benefits across different outcomes. So for this, we suggest, we had to suggest because we didn't have the data, either supervised maintenance pulmonary rehab or usual care, again, after initial pulmonary rehabilitation. And this was just a conditional recommendation with low quality evidence. We do, of course, believe that ongoing regular exercise is important for all patients. We just have inconsistent evidence about this to date. Um, lots of people need ongoing supervised exercise and support. So more to come on this, but we didn't have enough to recommend it. The last concept I just want to raise in the last couple of minutes is that one size does not fit all. People have a wide variety of rehabilitation needs, physically, functionally, and in terms of goals, caregiver support, motivation, and so on. So there's some people who could benefit with just sort of minimal intervention, maybe some e-health support for healthy lifestyle promotion, and people's disease may be able to be managed in primary care. There's others with multiple limitations who will need a heavier hitting, uh, more comprehensive approach, or even those with significant care dependency who may need a hospital inpatient-based approach. So what this leads to is the concept of personalized pulmonary rehab and where the field is going in the future is that we will establish a uh, and, and conduct a multidimensional comprehensive patient assessment looking for so-called treatable traits that are addressable in pulmonary rehab. And I encourage you to read Martin Spreit's uh, Respirology Review on this um, so you could see what kinds of things could be done for these different kinds of, of, of treatable traits. But the idea is assess it and then 
go into the kind of program that could best address those combination of needs. And, and an example of how that's important is a big uh, cohort of COPD patients was analyzed according to exercise capacity versus physical activity. In other words, what patients can do versus what they do do. Okay, And so you could divide people into four quadrants. We have people who have low exercise capacity and whose physical activity is low. People who have high exercise capacity measured on exercise cycle testing, but who still don't do any physical activity. We also have people who have low exercise capacity, but who try their best to stay active. And then there's a quadrant over here who can do both. But we may not need the same intervention for those different groups. The people with low exercise capacity need exercise training in pulmonary rehab to increase their exercise capacity before they'll be able to undertake increased physical activity. Whereas those people who already have high exercise capacity may need more of a physical activity behavioral type intervention. So not everybody needs the same thing. And just to, to um, highlight one very quick concept here that the field is moving in the direction of, we don't have time, this could be a talk in and of itself, but there's now a lot of research going on to try to understand the biological, cellular, and molecular underpinnings of what characterizes or what determines people's responses to exercise training, both at the muscle level and at the dyspnea reduction level for exercise uh, uh, responses in pulmonary rehab. So this is a very exciting area for the future. So our, 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 our holy grail here is that we'll get to a point where, just like picking a menu at a restaurant, you can identify people's treatable traits based on a comprehensive assessment, understand their goals, and in the future, we'll have cellular and molecular characterization together with then having a shared decision-making uh, conversation between patients and healthcare providers to decide and prioritize the components of pulmonary rehab needed to address the treatable traits and then decide the referral to appropriate care model. And hopefully in the future, we have a spectrum of care models nicely funded so that we can refer to the appropriate model. Just to finish here, we need to uh, comment that we've talked today about COPD, ILD, and pulmonary hypertension, but PH, I mean, pulmonary rehab is uh, demonstrable benefits for lots of other conditions as well, including CF, asthma, bronchiectasis, lung cancer, post-TB, after lung transplant, and COVID. So um, there's a whole literature around that. Again, we just couldn't address all of it in the guideline. So take home points, pulmonary rehab is an essential core component of the overall integrated care of patients with chronic respiratory diseases. It has clear benefits across multiple patient outcome areas. It's as effective, if not more effective than some pharmacotherapies. It's multidisciplinary, addresses the needs of patients over the trajectory of illness and across healthcare venues, considers the needs, concerns, and goals of the patient. It's a personalized, individualized treatment, but remains underutilized and we need to foster its access. We need to implement newer models of pulmonary rehab, but while maintaining quality and key expected benefits of those programs and funding should be a priority. To get there for all of that and to reach the holy grail I mentioned to you, we need ongoing advocacy regarding healthcare policy. We need public education, lots more research and funding and health system report for pulmonary rehab. And I've been proposing, uh, sort of tossing out there, trying to get uh, energy going for a possible national pulmonary rehabilitation action plan, similar to the one that was undertaken for COPD a few years ago. Let me leave you with this quote from Grace Ann Dorney Koppel, who was our patient representative, um, one of the most articulate and passionate um, advocates for pulmonary rehab that I know. She says, a diagnosis of COPD is a slap to the soul. It shatters your persona. There are few promising options. Pulmonary rehab, I believe, is the best one. I'm convinced pulmonary rehab saved my life. It jump-started my desire to live and has enabled me to live a good active life. I've been exercising seven days a week for 21 years. Without pulmonary rehab, I don't believe I'd be alive today. Pulmonary rehab can restore both body and soul. So happy spring, everybody, and thank you. Let's get out there and walk. <laughs> Questions? Thank you. That was an extraordinary talk. A great, a great um, overview for us. Do we have questions from the audience? While you're thinking, I have a question mm -hmm. for you. So because I come from the VA and the reimbursement issue is not the barrier, there are mm -hmm. other barriers, mm -hmm. as you well know. 
which you may speak to if you want. But I'm wondering how real is the reimbursement problem in the private sector? Do you what do you encounter? It's it's very real. The reimbursement factor in the don't speak too loudly about the issue with the VA because somebody might hear us and they might take away our ability to do what we do there. Um, <laughs> um, but um, uh, in the in the in the private sector, it's a huge problem. In fact, lack of funding threatens the very existence of of many programs. And as I said before, the reimbursement rates are are pathetically low. It's something like you know fifty dollars or less, and for for a, a pulmonary rehab session. So it's very very low, and it's less than half the reimbursement rate for cardiac rehabilitation. Um, programs just don't have enough infrastructure and resources. Almost all pulmonary rehab programs do it completely on a shoestring with passionate people um, just because it's the right thing to do and not because, because it's not really a money-making thing. It's a wellness-maintaining health preventative strategy, but people don't look at it like that. They look at like a salvage operation. So because it doesn't generate lots of money, um, it's it's not something that, that, that most health systems um, invest in very much. The hospitals are offering it for, you know, public service kind of thing and not getting reimbursed from either private insurance or Medicare, Medicaid. Whatever. They're getting reimbursed, but the reimbursement rates are just really, really low. So it's always a struggle to keep afloat. And, and one of the other important aspects to your question, Hillary, is that we have to be very careful. And the reason I said that telerehabilitation is... Um, something that is not meant to replace center-based pulmonary rehab is, um, first of all, we still have lots to learn about telerehab and its role uh, in the bigger picture. But by the same token, it's very concerning that um, uh, health system payers might say, okay, well, if telerehab is equally effective then across this or that outcome, then we'll take all the money we're using to reimburse center-based programs and we'll support telerehab, but then we won't have any more center-based program. So we have to be careful not to throw the baby out with the bath. So in the same vein, we know that patients go to cardiac rehab after they have a cardiac event and leave the hospital. So why, and you are on those committees to improve readmission, right? The mm -hmm. hospital readmissions after COPD. Why are we not automatically requiring on discharge rehab programs that patients get, that they get signed up as part of their discharge planning? So um, great question, Lauren, thanks. Um, we actually um, did an analysis of our uh, referrals to pulmonary rehab on our hospital discharges here in Yale at New Haven Health System um, and as of a couple of years ago, and it remains very, very low. It has improved a little bit, but it's pitiful. Um, we did build referrals to pulmonary rehab into our COPD inpatient care pathway, and it's part of the discharge sort of um, focused uh, teeing up. Part of the reason you can't just do it automatically is a lot of patients aren't suitable right away after the hospitalization. So some of them need to go to skilled nursing facilities, and of those who go home, a lot of them need a period of individualized physical therapy before they're ready to participate. But by the time they get into their rehab program, which usually takes a month or so. So they should still sign them up because... Yeah, it's it's hard. I mean, no, in concept, just, I agree with you. It's it's. But in, I think teaching teaching the hospitalists and house staff about this is really a great absolutely, idea. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, Carrie. All those studies, they're changing the name of my team. Oh. considered in is the, there... the question Carrie asked is how is the quality of the rehabilitation program um, assessed that's part of actually sort of it, it, it's difficult on an individual program basis but there were certain criteria that had to be met in order to be included in the studies in the analysis right so minimal expectations about what type of exercise training did they include and how many times a week and whether it was supervised and so on. So there was focus on that. Elizabeth, yeah, we'll have to wrap up. Last question. Uh, so I am a big proponent of pulmonary rehab and I try to very enthusiastically talk to my patients about the benefits of exercise training. And I find 
uh, kind of a surprising amount of resistance among a lot of my pH patients in particular about going to pulmonary rehab. Uh, and I wonder if the hesitancy, you know, the hesitancy is different for each patient, obviously, but I wonder how you uh, talk with your patients about pulmonary rehab and if you have any kind of tricks to convince the uh, disbelievers. Well, um, we can certainly um, have additional discussion about this going forward, but just in a sort of a, a, a summary sort of a, a focused way, I think the word rehab strikes a punitive tone with a lot of people. And so I present it as a wellness intervention to optimize what they can do and, and emphasize that they will be able to do more with less shortness of breath. Of course, in the pulmonary hypertension population, since we have no dyspnea data, that's a little bit challenging, but um, you know, it's, it's the general concept and, and, and we can get people to buy in. We also emphasize their safety and the fact that they'd be monitored. And unlike saying, hey, start doing a walking program on your own. Hey, we know you're gonna be safe. We're gonna monitor your heart rate. We're gonna be monitoring your O2 sats. We're gonna make sure you're doing okay. And then you'll know what you can do safely in your own day-to-day -day life. So it's a wellness kind of approach. I think, uh, oh. Mm -hmm. Much more than clinical trials in pH. Right. So it's the most benefit. Right. And, and um, uh, what Philip was just saying is that to emphasize to the patients also that the magnitude of Bennett in their walking distance, benefit and walking distance from pulmonary rehab is significantly greater than they get from their pharmacotherapy. So thank you for that comment. Thank you, everybody, for your attention.